you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when your back is against the wall and you've run out of time on the clock and you've run out of tricks up your sleeve? What do you do when you've tried and tried and you've bled and cried and it feels like you've made a dent about this big in the problem? When your marriage is beyond life support and you're not even sure you want to stay and fight but you've got kids and no option seems right? I mean, when this is the first time in your life you've been on unemployment or you had to take a pay decrease or get furloughed and bills are coming due and you don't know what to do. When the test results come back and it's your worst case scenario or when, like all of us, you've been staring into this huge problem of systemic racism in our country, which at times feels unsolvable and too big for any one person to handle. When it feels like the worst possible thing that could happen is staring you down and you know there's nothing you can do, what do you do? Well, maybe you end up in church online. In fact, you might be here today and you're not even sure you believe all Christians do, but you were invited by a friend or you did a Google search and you just ended up here and you're thinking, I'm not sure it's going to help any, but it can't hurt. Well, first, let me say how glad I am that you chose to join in with us today. My name is Nathan, and I think what we're going to be talking about today is going to be so applicable to you if anything I've said so far resonates with you. Because we're in the middle of a series all about faith and what faith looks like in our lives. Now, you might hear that and want to tune out because when you hear Christians talk about faith, it sounds like nonsensical Harry Potter wand-wielding Star Wars and the Force type stuff where if you just say the right words and pray the right prayers and believe hard enough... Well, God will do anything you want. In fact, you might have even grown up in church and you were basically taught that this was the point of being a person of faith, that faith meant we could pray away or faith away bad things from ever happening to us. And all you had to do was live for a few years and you realized that does not line up with reality because you knew someone who had great faith and they still got sick or you knew someone who went to church every Sunday and their marriage, it still fell apart. You knew someone, or maybe this is even you, who believed in God and prayed the right prayers and it just didn't work. And so experience just taught you this faith thing, that's nonsense. And I get that because that idea of faith, it doesn't line up with reality. But what we've been learning the past couple of weeks is a new definition of faith. We've said faith is not some power or some force that I wield that gives me leverage over God. Faith's not just good thoughts and feelings that I put out into the universe so good things come back to me. Faith is not just pretending that everything's okay so God doesn't feel like I'm somehow ungrateful for my life. If any of that sounds like your ideas about faith, I just have to say that doesn't line up with reality and it doesn't line up with what God or the Bible have to say. Here's the definition of faith that we've been working with. Faith is the confidence that God is who he says he is and that he will do everything he has promised to do. Faith is not confidence in my abilities, but confidence in God's abilities and his love for me. Faith is not trying to force God to do what I want him to do. It's me trusting that he will do everything he has promised to do. And that word promised, that's the key. It's not everything I want God to do or everything I think God should do. It's everything he promised to do. And that's what I want to spend our time today trying to figure out. What, what is it that God has promised me? Because there are things I think God should promise me and things I want him to promise me, but I can't hold God to my thoughts that sound like, well, if there is a God, then he must. Or if there is a God, then he would. Because if there is a God, then I don't get to decide what he must or he should do. It's my job to figure out what has he told me that he'd do. And for those of us who follow Jesus, we believe that Jesus is the most clear representation of who God is. When we look at Jesus, we see what God is really like. And Jesus never promised us a life free of trouble or of sickness. He never promised us that we would be wealthy or that all our uh, dreams would get accomplished. In fact, Jesus once promised his followers this. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. To which we want to say, yeah, but Jesus... How do I pray those away? And Jesus says, no, that's a promise. Trials and sorrows are an inevitability of this life. 
it's kind of hard to explain because I don't think that there was ever a moment where I was like, oh, my mom's not going to be here. Like, I realized that my mom was really sick. I realized that she was in the hospital. I realized that things were different. I realized that things were drastically changing. But I don't think I ever had a moment where I was like, oh, I think that I don't think that my mom was I didn't think that my mom wasn't going to be here anymore. So we were living in Reno. Me, my mom, and my sister lived in Reno. At the time, my, I was five and my sister was eight. And we all lived in Reno. And in 2004, we moved to Georgia for a job opportunity that my mom had. We had a typical life. She she worked hard to provide for us. I really believe like she always put herself last. She always provided for us. She always just wanted to take care of us and, and give us the best life that we could have. So I was 12 and it was summertime. Like we had just gotten out of school. We'd only been out of school for like a week. So it was probably like June. Our mom's fiance called us to tell us that he was on our his way to pick us up because our mom was in the hospital. She had a thing called bacterial meningitis. And so it's like a thing where it shuts down your organs. It shuts down several different things. And so the process, like she had to, at, at a point, learn to write, like rewrite. And she had to learn to do those small things that a, a four-year-old's doing, a five-year-old's doing. Like, unfortunately, that was kind of the beginning of me and my sister having to really grow up prematurely because at 12, I didn't really understand. But my sister was telling the doctors like, oh, she is taking this medication and she is doing this and she goes to this place and in this doctor or whatever. And so that was kind of the beginning of us really, that was, that would be our life for the next some odd years and, and really having to act a lot older than our age. And so, um, yeah. It was terrible, us being there. Um, it was not functional. It, it just wasn't good. And so we were moved um, from their home. We were there for four weeks and we moved to a group home. Our case was always kind of an anomaly because most of the kids that were brought there was because of, in any way, shape or form, like a dysfunctional family or dysfunctional whatever dysfunctional reason and for us it wasn't that it was just because we had a mom that was sick and there was we we had her and that was it and so and I will say the whole time through being in foster care I never really felt like there was an adult that was really for me like there was an adult that actually loved me like since my mom died, like I never had felt that. And I would remember, I would remember actually talking to God where I wouldn't understand why this was happening. I wouldn't understand because it really was devastation after devastation. It was an, another adult that I couldn't trust. There was another, an adult where I thought I could trust them, but I they weren't really for me and they weren't really they didn't really have my best interests at heart at the end of the day. And I remember really crying like almost every night and I wouldn't, and again, just processing from such a young age, like I really wouldn't understand why this was happening and this was my life and this was my reality. And I, I just, I do remember that constantly. Like I, I did that all the time. I would just cry and cry and cry. Now, I'll admit it, if you watch that story and you think about it, the kind of faith where you can't say the right thing or do the right thing to get God to do what you want, when what you want is to save the life of a single mom so her children don't have to go into foster care, that doesn't sound that attractive. In fact, it sounds pretty useless. What we want in situations like that, maybe what you want in your situation right now, is what we call divine intervention, right? I want God to get involved and do what I'm asking him to do. Well, if that's where you're at today, 
But you're in the same place that the closest followers of Jesus were in on the night before he was killed. You see, on this night, Jesus had a meal with his closest followers, and these guys were already in victory mode. Earlier that week, they had entered into Jerusalem with Jesus as this victorious king. The people were praising in the streets and shouting and leaping for joy, and everything pointed to Jesus being this long-promised Messiah and king of the people of Israel. And that was true. Jesus did bring about the strong and unshakable kingdom of God in this world. It just didn't happen like these men thought it would. I mean, when they thought of the power of God, they thought of military power, right? Armies and chariots and political power, a throne and a crown. They did not think of Jesus being crowned king with a crown of thorns, dying on a cross. They couldn't even picture it. And so on the night before Jesus' death, these men were riding high with dreams of power and glory. I mean, this right here is Michael Jordan, 1993, crying with the championship trophy. It felt like a victory lap for them. In fact, at this final meal, they're arguing about who's going to have the most power and authority when Jesus is brought into his kingdom. They thought their faith and trust in Jesus would be rewarded just like we do. He's going to make our lives better and more comfortable and more prestigious in this life. So at the end of this final meal, Jesus began to describe how he will be betrayed, how he's going to be killed, and how he's going to be leaving them. And still, they're not even really understanding him or honestly really listening to him because it's not what they want to hear. It's not attractive that this man they put all their hopes on could be killed. And then to make things worse, he begins to explain to them that their lives are going to get harder and that they, they will face suffering. He tells them that they, they will be thrown out of the synagogues, which basically meant full exclusion from society. And he even tells them that people will kill them just as people killed Jesus. And I'm sure this is all a 180 turn for them. It's not what they signed up for. It's not what they want. Their idea of faith was that their lives would get better and more prosperous. But to go back to our definition of faith, this is not at all what Jesus promised them. It's not what Jesus promised us either. He never promised us that things in our life would get easier or that wealth would come our way or that our family would stay healthy and that our children would respect us and appreciate all that we've done for them. Trust me, I got four girls. That's not reality. Jesus never promised us this. And so if we base our faith on everything going our way, then our faith will crumble. This is why Jesus said to his followers, I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. Because if your faith is in something he never promised, if your faith is in getting him to do what you want him to do, if your faith is in your family turning out just as you dreamed it would be, or your business never failing, if your faith is in your health, or your wealth, or your circumstances, well then th when those things fail, you might think that Jesus has failed you. But he never promised to make everything go your way. He says, put your faith in me. When your life feels unstable, and it will. When trouble comes your way, and it will. When you feel completely unconfident and incompetent, are you confident that God is who he said he is? Are you confident that he's a good God who loves you and wants only good things for you? Jesus would say, are you confident that I know better for you than you know for yourself? And are you confident that I will do everything that I promised to do for you? Because here is what I promise you. Jesus said to his followers, you grieve because of what I told you, but in fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. The advocate is the Holy Spirit of God. It's the same spirit that lived in and empowered Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit who's God himself. And Jesus explained that when he left, he would send the Holy Spirit to live in believers. He would give them God himself. Now, they couldn't imagine what could be better than Jesus reigning on earth as king. I mean, all their faith was in physically following Jesus around. They had no category for a life of faith that wasn't based on Jesus teaching and leading and doing miracles here on earth. How could anything be better than that? But Jesus said, it's best that I go away. What's better than having God walking around with you? Having God living within you empowering you, comforting you, encouraging you, guiding you in every moment to live like Jesus. They couldn't imagine this at all, but Jesus says, trust me, I know what's best for you. And I, and I know you 
can't imagine what your life will be like if your marriage falls apart or if your health fails or you never fully financially recover from the past few months. I know what you want is the power to get God to do what you want. I want divine intervention. And what God says to us is, you want to know how I'm going to intervene in your life? I'm going to enter into life with you. I'm going to live in you. I'll suffer with you. I'll cry with you. I'll celebrate with you when things go your way. I'll mourn when they don't. The cross is the evidence that God is not carelessly and passively watching the suffering in our world from afar. The cross shows us God taking on human flesh, participating in our suffering, taking it on himself. Does God care? Absolutely. And He is in the midst of all of our pain. This is what he promises us. He will be with us. And Jesus says to us that his presence in our lives is better than Jesus doing exactly what we want. In fact, he said it's a peace that is nothing like this world can give us. See, in this world, we can only have peace when our circumstances are just as we want them. But in the kingdom of God, we have peace because we know God is with us. And I get that you might be new to this whole church thing and you're not sure you believe any of this and now you're thinking, man, I'm not even sure I want to believe in it. How in the world could God being with me be better than God doing for me the things I want? And I get that, but see, this is where our faith begins. It doesn't begin with what I want God to do. It begins with who I know God to be. And for those of us who follow Jesus, we know who our God is. He is good and kind and full of tender and loving kindness for us. He is always working for our good, and He knows and wants what's best for us. And we know that we can have confidence, we can have faith to face anything in this life. Jesus 
Jesus, I know who you are. Jesus, I know who you are. So within a few years after Jesus' death and resurrection, his words came true for his followers. Persecution became widespread, and over the coming decades, as the Jesus movement of the church grew, persecution grew. And eventually, church leaders began writing letters to instruct believers on how to live out their faith in Jesus in their day-to-day -day lives, and to encourage them to hold on to their faith in the midst of persecution. And one of these writers wrote a letter that's now collected in our Bibles as the book of Hebrews, and the writer spoke to a church under persecution about why they should hold on to their faith even though their faith and their life wasn't working out like they thought it would. And this writer wrote the following words, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. The high priest was the person who represented the people to God. His job was to bring the prayers and requests and the sins and the failures of the people before God and ask for God to move on their behalf. And so the writer is saying, hey, we can hold on to our faith even when things are bad, even when it feels like our prayers aren't being answered like we want because we can be confident that Jesus is our great high priest. We can be confident that he is who he said he is and that he'll do everything he promised to do. Here's what he promises us. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And this phrase that he has been tempted in every way is not just about the kind of temptation we think of where there are immoral things that I'm tempted to do. Certainly, Jesus faced temptation just as we do, and he still never sinned, and there is encouragement in that. But this is about even more than that. In the original language, this word can also be translated as having your faith tested. And in the context of this entire book, the writer is trying to communicate that Jesus also understands our doubts and our questions of why. The Jesus who we follow is the same Jesus who asked God the Father to take away the cup of suffering before going to the cross. And still God said no. He's the same Jesus who cried out words of grief and lament on the cross, quoting an ancient psalm, asking, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He understands and can empathize with our deepest pains and doubts and questions. So we don't ever have to feel guilt or shame when, when we doubt or question why God isn't doing what we want him to. In fact, Jesus invites us to bring all of our concerns and all of our doubts and all of our frustrations and all of our desires to him because he understands them. He can empathize with them. And because of that, the writer explains that we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence or with faith so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, often when we hear grace, we hear God's going to forgive my sins. And certainly forgiveness is an act of grace, but you might then read that and think, so when I'm hurting or I want God to do something, he'll forgive my sin. That's all I can look forward to. But that's because you've not really gotten the full picture of what grace is. Grace is God acting in our life to bring about and to enable us to do what we cannot do on our own. So forgiveness is a part of that because, well, I can't do that for myself. But grace in my time of need can also be God giving me the strength to keep, get up and just keep going. It can be the motivation to hold on to my faith even when it feels like God's not answering my prayer how I want. Grace can be God giving us the wisdom to know what the next right thing to do is when the future is unclear. Grace is what causes those stories that you hear and I hear where someone goes through an unspeakable tragedy and they make it through to the other side and we all think, how did they do that? How are you so strong? How, how do you still have joy and peace in your life with everything you've gone through? I mean, how do some people get to the end of horrific circumstances and we've all heard them say something like, that was honestly the best thing that could have happened to me. How does that happen? Here's the truth. It didn't come from them. It's a gift of grace. It's God acting in their lives to bring about and enable them to do what none of us would be able to do on our own. 
And God gives us gifts of grace whether we believe in Him or not. And every good thing in our life is a gift of grace because our Father loves to give good gifts. And no matter what you think about God, I believe He can't stop thinking about you. So I believe if you'll look back through your life, you'll see a trail of these grace gifts all through your life. And God invites us to come to Him with all of our requests and all of what we hope He'll do. And we can know that even if He doesn't do exactly what we hope, we can know that He's promised to give us grace, the power to do what we cannot do on our own. And the beauty of grace is that it's a constant reminder, no matter what happens in our life, even in the worst tragedies, even in death, we are never out of reach of the goodness of God. Our tragedies, our sin, our fear for the future or of death, it does not have the final word in our lives. It does not win. God's grace always wins. When people hear my story, I think that they would feel sorry for me and not trying to be funny. Like if I heard my story from somebody else, like I would feel kind of sorry for them too. But I think I, I never would have thought that I would be where I am today. I think statistically in, in kids in foster care and statistically with all the things like I shouldn't be where I am today, but I think seeing God in those small things and seeing God in those details, I think that God for me personally is all around me. I think that if I if I'm willing to look and I think if people are willing to look and see God in those difficult times, it's really really hard especially when you're in pain and especially when you do want to give up and especially in those times where it's like god i didn't sign up for this like this is not what i wanted my life to be this is not what i saw my life to be i think in whatever circumstance that is i i believe that god is with me i believe that god has been with me this whole time and again it's hard to say those during those small, t those hard times, but it's like, I think looking back, being able to see God in the details of my life. And sometimes, honestly, I still struggle. And I definitely wouldn't say that I, I arrived. I think being at the place where I am now, like I want to honor God with whatever he has given me. And I think it's definitely taken me a long time. Like if you'd have asked me that five, six, whatever amount of years ago, and that wouldn't be my answer. And I'll be like, oh, whatever. And I think growing up, you hear all the time, like God is so good. And I think God is this. And I think as a child, I didn't understand that. But you always hear your Sunday school teachers say, God is so good. In messages, you hear God is so good. And in songs, you hear God is so good. And so I think for me, the other week, I, I, I really sat down with God and I was like, God, what what is the goodness? Uh, like, what makes you good? just kind of processing like God has been good to me and there's been times in my life where I didn't understand that and I didn't see that and there's times where I still go through that and I still see that and I and I still God still has to remind me of that where I'm like God I don't you weren't you weren't what I wanted you to be but I think just because God isn't what we want him to be doesn't mean that he's not good and I think a lot of times as believers we kind of look at God like Oh, you're good once once you do what I asked you to do. You're good once you answered this prayer. You're good once this problem in my life has gone away. But I think when we try to see God for what he's done and not for, like, we love God and see God for who he is and instead of for his hand and what he can give us. When I change my perspective and when I change what I see in, in the different lenses, like our, our whole life can change. And I think for me, again, just for me deciding like, no, I'm gonna believe that God is good. And I see what I don't have and I see what other people may have. And I see what I wish that my life would have been like, but I also see what God has done for me. And I also see, I didn't have an ideal childhood in, in part, I don't have an ideal adulthood but it's it's still a thing of like no I'm gonna believe that God is still good regardless I'm gonna believe that God is faithful I'm gonna believe that God loves me even through my circumstances so so even though God hasn't promised to do everything we want him to do or to make our lives go smoothly and simply we can still be confident that he has promised us his Holy Spirit to live in us and to give us grace and mercy in our time of need 
Now, mercy, just like grace, we often think of as just being about God forgiving us of our sins. But a better idea to think of when you think of mercy is the way early readers of the Bible would have heard the word for mercy. It's this word picture that represents the tender, womb-like love that a mother has for her children. We often think of God as our Father because that's how Jesus told us to address God. But it's also true that God has maternal, tender, and nurturing qualities. And I am so thankful for this. I have four little girls. I know, please pray for me. I need some grace for that. And I love my girls, but I'm not great at the mercy part. When they fall off their bike or scrape their knee or just do what five-year-old girls do and cry because they wanted strawberry icing, but they got pink icing instead. And I try to tell them that the pink icing is the strawberry icing, but they keep screaming, I wanted strawberry, I wanted strawberry. I'm not great at that, but my wife, she's like the Beyonce of tenderness. I'll watch her hold them and wipe away their tears and treat them with gentleness as they talk about their hurts and their fears and their emotions that are so overwhelming and where I might always have this hint of sarcasm or this that's not that big of a deal in my voice. She has this gentle caring tone to her voice that tells them, I see your pain. I feel how hard this is for you. I, I know you want me to fix it and I know you want this just to go away, but can I sit with you? Can I hold you? Can I sing words of love to you? I am here for you. And even though the pain doesn't go away, her loving kindness is more overwhelming than what they're feeling. It's a sense of calm and love that goes deeper than the pain. This is what God promises to us. He promises that he will be with us in every moment, in the highs and the lows of life, that his spirit will never leave us. So we can approach God with what we hope he will do, and we can know that no matter what he does, he will always give us the grace to do what we could never do on our own and the merciful, tender, loving kindness to overwhelm our souls. It may not take away the pain or the disappointment we feel, but it will be better than what we could ever imagine. And even if you're not sure you believe in God, you are surrounded by His mercy. You can't escape His loving presence. No matter who you are or what you've done, He is pouring out love and grace and mercy on you. In fact, one writer of the Bible describes the intimate and loving nature of God's presence like this. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, meaning if I could live in the air like birds, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning and dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. In other words, nothing can separate me from the love of God. What's better than the hand of God doing exactly what I want? The fullness of God living in me, empowering me, and comforting me as I go through the highs and lows of life. And no matter what happens, He will never stop chasing me because He's too good to let me go. So, would you 
sea is an even flow You're too good to let me go Should I dance on the heights Or make my bed among the depths Mercy waits at every You planned it from the start Should the dawn come with wings Or find me far side of the sea Then your hand still fastens me Ever closer to your heart examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me and you place your hand of blessing on my head. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave you are there if I ride the wings of the morning if I dwell by the farthest oceans even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me I could hide from the darkness I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night but even in the darkness I cannot hide from you to you the night shines as bright as day darkness and light are the same to you how precious are your thoughts about me oh God they cannot be numbered I can't even count them. Highs and lows, you surround me the way it goes. Should I rise or should I fall? Lord, you're with me through it all. time when the mercy and grace of God became most evident to human beings was on the moment when Jesus gave his life on the cross for us. From the outside it seemed like a moment of failure and defeat, but for thousands of years followers of Jesus have taken part in a meal known as communion, which reminds us not only of the death of Jesus, but the victory of his resurrection. So if you're a follower of Jesus, would you take any elements that you have nearby to represent the body of Jesus, maybe a piece of bread or a cracker and anything you have to represent his, his blood. Maybe that's a cup of juice or even water like I have here. Would you hold those right now? And if you're not sure you believe any of this, I want you to know that I'm so glad you joined in with us today. And maybe during this time that I get is a little strange. Maybe you can just reflect on all you've experienced today. Is it true that there is a God who loves you and wants to give you grace and mercy in your time of need? If you're a follower of Jesus, as we eat the bread, remember the grace of God that was given for you when Jesus gave up his body for us on the cross, not only for the forgiveness of your sins, but for the gift of his Holy Spirit living in you. And now take the cup of juice. And as you drink, I want you to 
Set your mind on the merciful love of God that was poured out for you through the blood of Jesus. Drink and imagine that just as this juice enters into your body, the Spirit of God is living fully within you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. This amazing gift of grace that you just freely give to us. Your Spirit that lives within us, that empowers us, gives us mercy in every moment, your comfort and your tender loving kindness to strengthen us in every moment of this life. Father, I pray that everyone listening right now would feel that, that we would all move closer to you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Well, I hope this experience has been helpful to you today, and I hope that you'll plan on joining us again next week. And if you haven't done so yet, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook to stay up to date with all that we have going on as a church. And if throughout the service today you felt moved and you want to know, so what do I do now? I want you to text the words next step to the number that you see on screen and I will personally talk with you to figure out what your next step is with God or with our church. I'd love to do that for you, so please do that right now. And I also hope that you'll plan on joining with us next week as we continue our series on faith and we discover what do we do when it seems like God is saying no to us. And I know it's going to be very powerful, so please join us again for that. And for this coming week, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus be with you wherever you may go. May he guide you through the wilderness, and protect you through the storm, and bring you back to us rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. I love you all. See you soon.